Hello everyone, uh, this is Jeff with Mississippi and the Civil War. Back with part three of uh, Beneath Torn and Tattered Flags, a history of the 38th Mississippi Infantry CSA. And if you haven't watched the first two parts, uh, I highly suggest you go back and watch those first. As uh, I'm continuing the story of the regiment and you really need to hear it uh, from beginning to end in order for it to, to make uh, sense and for you to get the full, uh, full scope of the uh, history of this uh, interesting regiment. But where we left off, in the last episode, the 38th Mississippi had just fought in the Battle of Corinth, Mississippi in October 1862. And we're going to pick up uh, right from there with uh, the what happened to the regiment immediately after the Battle of Corinth. So in late October 1862, the 38th Mississippi, with the rest of the, of the Army, was ordered to Camp Rogers, located several miles outside of Holly Springs, Mississippi. Here the exhausted and footsore rebels finally had an opportunity to rest and recover from nearly two months of active campaigning. Uh, the location of the camp was well chosen. Sergeant Willie Tunnard of the 3rd Louisiana Infantry said of Camp Rogers, quote, it was a pleasant one on the hills amidst the shadows of large oak trees. In front of it were wide extended fields, formerly cultivated in cotton, now covered with corn stubble. So he, he paints a very vivid picture there of, of what uh, the camp was like for the men that, uh, that had to live there. Once uh, the 38th Mississippi reached Camp Rogers, uh, the high command immediately set about uh, work rebuilding the army. And the 38th was going to be a big part of that because uh, they needed to make good the losses due to casualties and desertion. Toward this end, uh, Robert McKay, acting major of the 38th Mississippi since the wounding of Walter Kern at Corinth, received the following orders on October 24th. Quote, Major R.C. McKay of the 38th Mississippi Regiment is hereby detailed to proceed to the camps of instruction at Brookhaven and Enterprise, Mississippi, to receive such conscripts as may be assigned to the 38th Mississippi Regiment by the proper state authority and conduct them at once to this command. He will also assemble and conduct uh, to this command all officers and men now absent without proper authority. And believe me, there were plenty of those. Uh, so gathering conscripts and running down deserters to fill the ranks of the regiment was a process that was going to continue all winter long uh, in 1862, early 1863. And uh, for their efforts, they were only going to meet with modest success. In a role of the 38th Mississippi taken in February 1863, 38th Mississippi was able to muster only 264 men. And while the 38th was being rebuilt, uh, the Army itself was undergoing a massive reorganization, starting at the very top with General Earl Van Dorn. In the wake of his disastrous Corinth campaign, the Mississippian was transferred to a cavalry command, and he was replaced by Lieutenant General John C. Pemberton. Pemberton was assigned command of the Department of Mississippi and East Louisiana on October 1, 1862, and he arrived in Jackson on October 14th and began to sort out his new army. In the shakeup of the army that followed the change of command, General Louis A. Bear was relieved of, as head of a division and sent back to lead his old brigade. Uh, the division was given to Major General Dabney H. Morey. For the 38th, uh, the death of Colonel Martin led to the breakup of the brigade uh, and uh, the Mississippi regiments were assigned to General Hebert. And so after this transfer, Hebert's brigade consisted of the following units, the 3rd Louisiana Infantry, the 21st Louisiana Infantry, the 7th Mississippi Infantry Battalion, the 36th, 38th, and 43rd Mississippi Infantry Regiments. And assigning Mississippian, Mississippians and Louisianans to the same brigade was not an instant success. Uh, there was considerable friction uh, between the, uh, the, the two groups. The 3rd Louisiana and the 21st Louisiana were both early war units. They were mostly made up of volunteers. These were proud men, and they considered serving alongside Mississippians, many of whom were conscripts. Uh, they felt this was a slight on their honor. In fact, uh, Sergeant, Sergeant Willie Tunnard of the 3rd Louisiana recounted the following incident that kind of illustrates the feelings in his regiment. And he said, quote, General Hebert came into camp and was immediately surrounded by the men, 
who complained bitterly that they were put into a conscript brigade. The general replied, Never mind, my men, never mind. You will soon make good soldiers of them all. The compliment thus delicately paid to the efficiency of the regiment did not soothe the irritated and discontented feelings. And while the animosity uh, of the Louisianans would fade over a time, uh, it never completely disappeared. And relations uh, with the Mississippians were going to be strained uh, for the entire time that the two groups to serve together in the same brigade. And as John C. Pemberton went about the task of reorganizing his department, Ulysses S. Grant uh, was preparing his federal troops for a drive on Vicksburg. On November 2, 1862, he moved five divisions to Grand Junction, Tennessee. And on November 8, the vanguard of a 31,000-man Yankee force swarmed into Mississippi, marching for the town of Holly Springs. Pemberton responded to this invasion by ordering his troops south to the strong defenses that were behind the Tallahatchie River at Abbeville. Uh, Union cavalry entered Holly Springs on November 13th, and by December 1st, federal troops were crossing the Tallahatchie River. Now, the steady advance of the uh, Yankees in North Mississippi forced Pemberton to order another withdrawal, this time behind the Yalabusha River at Grenada. Uh, terrible weather conditions made this march a miserable uh, one for the men of the 38th as they had to journey through a nasty winter storm with a hostile army nipping at their heels. Private James Floyd of the Wilkinson Guards, uh, Company D of the 38th, described uh, these hardships in a letter to his wife, Mary. And he said in his letter, quote, We left camp alone near Abbeville on Monday, the first day of this month, after lying in the breastworks for two days and nights, and having been marching every night. Still it is raining. All night and this morning it is, it is sleeting and snowing. We have plenty of hard times with poor soldiers in such weather as this. I don't expect to get to camp before sometime tonight or tomorrow. The mud is frozen shoe mouth to half leg deep all the way, so you can know that we have hard times on this march. So I can only imagine just how nasty that must have been, marching over really poor roads that were muddy, frozen, and just sleet coming down on you. The weather was horrible. You're freezing cold. And uh, you can imagine this kind of uh, exposure to the elements was going to uh, play havoc with the health of the regiment, and it certainly did. This constant exposure uh, caused numerous uh, uh, casualties from disease, and in November and December, 16 men in the 38th Mississippi died of disease. Uh, nine more were so weak that they fell out on the march and were captured by the enemy. But uh, Pemberton was able to safely withdraw his army uh, behind the Yalabusha River, and uh, at this time, Grant decided uh, to make a bold gamble to try and take Vicksburg. While his main army pinned the Confederates at Grenada, he ordered General Sh William T. Sherman to take 30,000 men from Memphis, transport them down the Mississippi River by steamboat, and strike directly at Vicksburg. Unfortunately, Grant's plan was going to go awry almost immediately when Confederate raiders under General Earl Van Dorn captured and destroyed Grant's supply base at Holly Springs. With his army deep in enemy territory and uh, with his supplies uh, uh, destroyed or captured, Grant was forced to withdraw back to Memphis, ending his first attempt to take Vicksburg. Sherman, uh, in his attack on Vicksburg uh, directly, was not going to fare much better. His attack at Chickasaw Bayou, just north of the city, ended in a bloody defeat on December 29, 1862. In the wake of this setback, uh, Sherman loaded his men back on their transports and slowly steamed uh, north, ending the 1862 threat uh, to Vicksburg. With, this, uh, with the Yankee uh, attack foiled, uh, Maury's division was transferred to Snyder's Mill on the high ground just north of Vicksburg. This was 12, about 12 miles north of the city. Uh, they arrived on New Year's Day, 1863. Uh, the 38th Mississippi manned a set of fortifications uh, at Snyder's Bluff overlooking uh, the Yazoo River with the assignment of uh, protecting a series of log rafts that were anchored at the mouth of the Yazoo to keep Union gunboats from entering the waterway. 
And during this time, they were at Snyder's Bluff. Uh, only real complaints uh, that came from the men in the regiment were about the quality of the food issued, which was a constant complaint, and also the boredom of camp life at Snyder's Mill. Uh, Joseph Pendleton, uh, who was in Company C of the 38th, wrote to his sister in March 1863. He told her, Oh, how I wish I had some butter and eggs and cakes. The officers get plenty of favors, and we privates don't get any at all. Sister, you don't know how much help to my mind if I had some interesting books to read. I am so lonesome here. My little testament is a good friend to me. I would write oftener if I had the paper. It cannot be gotten easily. And uh, Private Pendleton was not the only one in the regiment to seek comfort from his Bible. In the spring of 1863, Confederate soldiers throughout the South were swept up in a wave of re religious revivalism, and many in the 38th Mississippi were eager participants. Pinckney Johnston, uh, the regimental chaplain of the 38th, wrote of this uh, religious fervor that was sweeping through the rank and file. He said, uh, quote, We have had for the past week very interesting prayer meetings. They were very well attended and the very highest interest manifested. Souls are hungry for the bread of life. Often in these prayers meetings, there are from, in, in these prayer meetings there are from twelve to twenty mourners, and a mourner was some, considered someone who had not been saved. There have already been two or three conversions, and four have joined the church. Sinners are being awakened, mourners comforted, and the Christian established in the faith. Now, while they were not on duty or attending religious services, the men did their best to break up the monotony of the camp. Uh, and uh, Erastus Hoskins, who was uh, uh, a member of the regiment from uh, Holmes County, wrote in his, a letter to his wife, quote, Our boys amuse themselves in various ways, some tussling, some having games, chicken fights, etc. It is astonishing sometimes to see them. After lying in the trenches all night, they are as lively as if they had just started out. And uh, the boredom of camp life was briefly interrupted on March 14, 1863, when Grant uh, sent a small naval force up Steele's Bayou, north of Vicksburg. The orders of this federal task force were to find a usable route to, to get behind the Vicksburg defenses. Uh, the fleet of five ironclads plus their auxiliary vessels were supported by a division of infantry from General, General Sherman's 15th Army Corps. In response to this incursion, Pemberton organized a detachment at Vicksburg, uh, commanded by Brigadier General Stephen D. Lee, to follow the Yankees and harass them from the rear. Now, for Lee's uh, expedition to be successful, men were needed who were familiar with this swampy wilderness of Steele's Bayou, and a detachment from the Holmes County Volunteers, led by uh, Lieutenant Samuel D. Gwynn of Company A, uh, were selected to go on this ma this mission. In a letter to his wife, uh, Erastus Hoskins mentioned uh, the uproar that the Yankee expedition caused in camp. He said in his letter, quote, I saw a flatboat come down the river loaded with Negroes, which the owner had brought from Deer Creek. He reported seven gunboats in Deer Creek and about 10,000 infantry and cavalry troops there. I can't believe there is so many. As most persons in the Army see a few thousand men together and magnify the number. General Hebert is busy, in, uh, is busy in having guns planted so as to range up the river in case the gunboats should attempt to come down here. We have not heard from Sam and Edward, Edgar Gwynn since they left. I believe I mentioned that they called for 30 men from the regiment and one lieutenant to go up the river picketing. They were all taken from John's company, this is John Hoskins of Company A, and Lieutenant Gwynn in command of the 30. The call was for 250 from the brigade. I don't know what point uh, to which they were sent. And uh, this expedition uh, to harass the Federals up Steele's Bayou did make life very hard for the Yankees. They were constantly uh, felling trees to impede the progress of the, uh, the boats. They were constantly sniping at anyone that dared expose themselves on one of the, one of the ships. Uh, and eventually the Federals were forced to withdraw to avoid the capture of the little fleet, and by March 27, 1863, the ships had re-entered the Mississippi River. However, for Lieutenant Gwynn and his plucky detachment uh, from Company A, uh, they did not return after the Yankee threat ended. 
Instead, they remained stationed north of Vicksburg, and as it turned out, they would not see the rest of the regiment again for nearly six months. Now, in this time, the, the stalwart little band uh, was going to go far, very far and see very much, and their adventures uh, will be dealt with uh, later in the narrative. And one other interesting event that took uh, place that spring of 1863 was the replacement of the 38th Mississippi's Division Commander. Uh, General Maury was transferred, and Major General John H. Forney replaced him in April 1863. And the 38th Mississippi's peaceful respite uh, at Snyder's Mill uh, ended very abruptly the night of April 30, 1863, when uh, the Union Navy uh, appeared and attempted to enter the Yazoo River. Uh, the fleet consisted of three gunboats and eight transports, and while they looked very fearsome, they were simply acting as a diversion so that General Ulysses S. Grant could land his army below Vicksburg without interference. These gunboats put up a very good show. Uh, they attempted to knock out the rebel artillery on the bluffs, but after a two-day bombardment that caused very little damage and few casualties, the enemy ships withdrew and sailed back downriver. Uh, during the heavy cannonade, the soldiers uh, just hugged the bottom of their entrenchments and the 38th Mississippi reported no casualties. It was a bloody, bloody, bloodless beginning to the regiment's bloodiest campaign, the Siege of Vicksburg. And uh, we will be talking in great detail about the Siege of Vicksburg in the next episode. And I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this short uh, episode. It was kind of a, a filler. It's kind of, it, it, there's no big action that took place, but it really uh, uh, touches on events that needed to be explained before we get into the, the Vicksburg campaign proper. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give it a like and a thumbs up. I uh, recommend this channel to your friends that are interested in the Civil War in Mississippi. Uh, I hope you, uh, hope you tune in for the next installment, which will be coming forth uh, very shortly, and have a great day.